There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to, to another lecture and uh, Q&A uh, sort of interview style with, with Dr. Riggins. Um, Dr. Riggins was a philosophy professor for, for many decades and um, in institutions like NYU um, and, and New School. Um, um, and yeah, and today we're going to be talking about aesthetics and, and Marxism and specifically Marxist materialism and, and aesthetics. Um, there was a corresponding article to, to the chat today, and I'm going to be linking that in the description of the video. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Riggins, take it away. Well, this is a, a little talk on some ideas on a Marxist philosophy of art. Okay, the original title, uh, I have a new title because I revised it, uh, but the, the original title was Dialectics and the Philosophy of Art, Four Features of a Marxist Approach to Culture. So what do we as Marxists, what, how do we get along with the cultural people, the artists and the actors and the movie stars? As we know, historically, there was some problems between the communist governments in Eastern Europe and China and Cuba between what they thought the artists should be doing and what the artists, some artists wanted to do. Of course, there were many artists that supported the government and cooperated with the government and wrote art that um, the government thought was um, helpful in the transition to socialism, that they're trying to make a transition to socialism and supported uh, working class interests. And there were some uh, artists who may have that may have been their intention and they probably would have done it if the critics, sometimes government officials who didn't know a lot about art, uh, were very conservative in their tastes and uh, just wouldn't allow them and would even imprison them if, or kick them out of the country uh, if they wrote in what they didn't call the, a standard socialist realist position. So I just wanna point out that a Marxist critique of art is not the only uh, way that you can look at art. There are many different philosophies of art. Um, some are reactionary, many are progressive. It doesn't have to be just one Marxist interpretation and all the others are outlawed. We would, of course, if you're going to have a socialist country, you're not going to want your artists uh, painting great portraits of Robert E. Lee winning battles and stuff like that, that, that would not be, uh, <laughs> that would not be considered something the government should support. And, and we wouldn't want the Ku Klux Klan artists uh, having the, there will not be absolute freedom of people can do whatever they like under Marxism. Although we think that human beings under Marxism will have a much greater range of opportunity to develop their talents than they, than they do under capitalism because their lives and their incomes and their health will be secure and they'll have a lot of leisure time to either be creative or enjoy the creations of others. But this paper is for those who want to do Marxist criticism of art. And I would suggest there are four things that we have to take in line if we want to look at a work of art and say this work of art will promote the type of emotional response in people that will lead them to support humanistic values and values of uh, socialism and peace and everybody loving everybody. Oh, that's a great work of art. And the ones that we don't like are ones that get you out there going zig heil because they're talking about racial superiority. Um, there were fascist novelists. I don't think any novelists in the history of the fascist movement, Nazi movement, I won't say it, there were a couple of no novelists that got Nobel Prizes that were sort of soft on fascism. But uh, there were two or three Nobel Prizes in literature presented to Russians. One was uh, an author who supported the Soviet Union, and we all know the other one was Solzhenitsyn, who didn't. Uh, but uh, and he he was e exiled. So 
it's very touchy subject, but let's see what we would have to do if we really wanted to have a Marxist philosophy of art. The first feature is that we would have to use, when we look at an artwork, we have to understand what Marx and Engels mean by historical materialism. This is their basic philosophy of how history changes, what motivates history, how the class struggle works, how there are exploiting classes and there are exploited classes. And if you want to have a Marxist art, you have to understand whether that art in some way is encouraging the exploitation of a ruling class of a, of a lesser class, or if it helps to humanize and liberate those the lower lower class people to get to get rid of exploitation. And if you don't understand historical materialism, you won't be able to get these ideas out of a work of art when you read it. A, a good example, for instance, as all Marxists know, is Engels' love of Balzac. That Balzac was a reactionary monarchist. He would love to have the king of France back. And he kowtowed to all of the aristocracy. But his novels, he was honest and realistic, Engels says. I've, I've read most of his novels, and so I know that Engels is completely correct. He doesn't present that ruling class in glowing lights. He pr presents them as what they were, hypocritical and liars and exploiters. But he was fascinated by that type of people. And uh, that's what he wanted to be like them. The duh and honore de Balzac, he added the duh so that he, that's nobility, people who came from a nobility had the duh there. And so he just stuck his own, it's, and it has, it's stuck with him. People always refer to him as honore de Balzac. He married an aristoc a Russian aristocrat and he's the, the happiest day of his life is when he visited her. They went to her estate in Russia and they, serfs fell on their faces in front of him as the new owner. And he, he said, this is the way people should be treated by the serfs. So <laughs> you wouldn't think you were gonna get progressive uh, novels, but you got progressive novels. Engels said you would learn more about France, how France operates and how the capitalists operate by reading Balzac's novels than you would by reading any of the philosophers or scientists who are telling you about it. So, because he realized that Balzac was practicing, although unconsciously, uh, real historical materialist uh, writing. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the first thing. The second thing that we have to take into consideration is the social context of the era that we're dealing in. We cannot, as, we, as many people on the left do, you cannot really understand any era of history if you take your era and your time's value system back like in a time machine to ancient Egypt or Greece or even the American South and try to impose values that were not commonly understood or known at the time. Now, as you get closer to our time, you can become more critical. It's ridiculous, for instance, to hold Greeks to the same standards of their ideas about slavery as it is that the way that we hold this, the South. Because philosophers and people of goodwill had known for at least a hundred years before even the American Revolution that this slavery was not a good idea and that it was really exploitative, but it was money. People made money out of it and that it wasn't gonna change. It took a civil war to get rid of it. I think it persisted in Brazil for another 20 years after, uh, after it was eliminated here, sort of eliminated. <laughs> uh, but the values that we had, the Greeks didn't have, they just thought it was natural for people to be slaves. If you read the Bible, St. Paul has slaves. He he doesn't have slaves, but he tells the slaves, he has no idea that there shouldn't be slaves. He tells them slaves should be obedient to their masters. 
that's uh, in one of his letters, Corinthians, or I forget which one. <clears throat> I was very little when I had to read the Bible. <clears throat> so that's uh, the second thing. Second thing we have to take into consideration is the social, the social context. So what about the third? The third is the most complicated because Marx and Engels' appreciation of art, they did not write aesthetic books, but they made uh, comments about art and comments about writers of the past and literature that when you sew them all together from their collected works, you get, an, you get some idea of what they, uh, a Marxist philosophy of art would involve. And the third thing is the dreaded dialectical logic inspired by Hegel that they use in their writings. Now this logic is, um, Hegel was an idealist, an objective idealist as opposed to an, uh, a uh, subjective idealist. Subjective idealists don't believe anything exists except some type of spiritual substance that manifests itself. An objective idealist does believe that there are ideas and ideas may exist independently of matter, but they, they don't really exist unless they are objectified in some type of material element. For instance, the, the justice, Plato is, is in some sense an objective idealist. He has a world of ideas that exists independently of our world, but those ideas don't really exist unless they manifest themselves in material substance, like tableness has to be a real table. If you don't have any real tables, then you would never even have the idea of tableness. So there's still argument about whether mathematical ideals are discovered or whether they're there. The, did Newton discover the calculus or was the calculus just there operating independently of human beings, uh, those lo mathematical laws. It's, it's a very complicated uh, argument you have with idealists with their, some of their ju justifications. But the dialectical logic is basically this. Hegel thought that everything was in flux, that things change, that what's going back to an ancient Greek, Heraclitus, he said, the famous thing that we all know if you had philosophy course, that you can't step in the same river twice because new waters are always flowing over you. Uh, that is basically the philosophy of the existentialists. So we got Sartre and Hegel right there. <laughs> if we just, if we understand that. Uh, in the Analects, Confucius is standing by the bank of the river and he makes a comment see the water flowing on, flowing on. So it's not saying, you know, it's sort of like saying, oh, he's got a little Heraclitus there, you know, if he, if he hadn't been interrupted by somebody asking a question, <laughs> he may have developed that, that thought more. Okay, so materialist um, philosophy developed, as we know, out of the works of Descartes and the French Enlightenment the general 18th century enlightenment. These materialists uh, were not dialectical. In other words, they didn't think of things as always in motion and flux and change. They thought that the, whatever existed was, was material. The laws of nature were material, but they didn't change. This was before Darwin. It'd be hard for people to, to, to think that animals you know, fish turned into a human being or they didn't have that time frame of billions and millions of years because the Bible had um, made them think the earth was re relatively young. It was a revolutionary early eight, late 18th, the early 19th century geologists who came out with the idea that earth could be millions of years old. That, that idea took a couple of generations to catch on and then that animals could change. <clears throat> but when you think of it retroactively, you see a tadpole and you see a frog, you wouldn't think they were the same animal unless you watched in an aquarium, the 
the development of how the tadpole turned into a frog. <laughs> so they were not, the big deal with Marx is he took that materialism and he applied the flexing dialectic that Hegel had invented and put them together to make dialectical materialism as opposed to dialectical idealism. You could call Hegel an I, a dialectical idealist and the Marxists are a dialectical materialist. So we got three things now. We have the materialism of the French mixed into the historical materialism uh, that Marx is, and Engels have thought up plus the dialectic that came from Hegel. Okay, so the correct application of this dialectical way of thinking to art is the problem of having a Marxist theory of art. <clears throat> now there was a Marxist philosopher in England in the 30s named Christopher Codwell. That's his pen name for uh, Christopher St. John Sprig or St. John, we say St. John, the British, when they pronounce St. John's often just say uh, Sejen. But in American English, Sejen is St. John. You know, they may be pronouncing it in some, their version of French. Okay, in his book, Illusion and Reality, he <clears throat> wants to bring together two things that seem separate to many people. And that is the scientific view of the world and an artistic and humanistic view of the world. It's a, a fight that goes on all the time between the humanities department and the science department. After Sputnik, the science department won and the humanities department has been in decline ever since. But the um, point of Codwell is that we have this Marxist theory the Marxist theory should also apply to our physical existences, biology, psychology, um, religious beliefs, whatever. They are also constantly in change and flux. And you have to use the same method to study uh, scientific things because the world does change uh, as you do to change, uh, as you do when you look at the world and you try to see how literature and art change in the social, as the social context changes. And because these methods are the same, he maintains that science and art really are just two aspects of the same human desire to understand and change the world they live in. And so they shouldn't be seen as rivals and they shouldn't be seen as like in separate compartments somewhere and have nothing to do with each other. They should be seen as two sides of the same coin and when you try to isolate them and make them be at war with each other, it makes understanding the world we live in more complicated rather than less complicated. So that's, uh, that's his contribution. He asked a question that we could all ask, and that is what happens when someone makes a mistake in philosophical reasoning? Now, Sartre thought, that in search for method, that every philosopher who doesn't embrace Marxism has made a mistake in philosophical reasoning. And that all of the criticisms that modern people, that is people's contemporary, have against Marxism are simply old arguments that had already been made and refuted by Marxism uh, just dressed up in new language and new clothes, but it's like putting lipstick on a pig, that old argument is there. And so that you have to use Marxism as the basis for any philosophical understanding of the world. That was his position when he wrote the critique of uh, dialectical reason. So let's see this dialectic. You make a mistake in philosophical reasoning for two basic reasons. One is you overgeneralize. You take a few examples of something and you, oh, that everybody is like that. And you get a whole, all dictators are the same. 
this overgeneralization and not looking at the specific context in which things develop, if you just do that and make it so simple, you will distort the reality you're trying to explain and you won't explain anything. The other mistake you make is when you run into a logical contradiction. When you run into a logical contradiction in your reasoning, you know you've made a mistake. So what you want to do is eliminate the contradiction. And how you do that is you either stop cold if you follow a certain type of regular logic and just say, oh, okay, throw that idea out completely because it results in a contradiction. Or you use the contradictory statements, you study them in a way to see how they will develop by borrowing aspects from each other to form a new type of reality on a higher level, preserving what is good in the old ideas and dismissing what is bad in the, the old ideas. A, an example like that is just take the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church really doesn't like to change very much. But Luther came along and practically condemned the whole Catholic Church, the Pope, the anything that wasn't in the Bible. It's okay back in you know 1400s. I mean, be pretty literal because they don't have modern science. They don't know what's going on. Uh, but he was uh, opposed to um, what he thought the Church was doing, which was uh, basically selling blessings and charging people money for indulgences and you could pay for your sin ahead of time, all the things he accused them of. <clears throat> and that caused a rupture. We know the wars, the religious wars, where Catholics didn't think Protestants were Christians. They were just not Christians. And Protestants didn't think Catholics were Christians. They thought it was Roman paganism all dressed up. Well, there you have a big contradiction between Catholic and Protestant. You have contradiction between Jew and Christian and Muslim and Christian, all these contradictions, but, and they fight and kill each other, they still are doing it. If you use a dialectical logic, though, you would sit down as you do in like the National Council of Churches or whatever, or these ecumenical councils with other religions, and you sit down and say, what do we have in common? Okay. And you find out, well, we all have in common that we all believe in one God, okay? Uh, you guys over there, you sort of little got number problem with the three popping up all the time. But basically, it's the one God that we all believe in. So we can agree on that. We can agree that um, you should not be vengeful. You should, you know, you should love your neighbors and be trying. Yeah, we have a, got a lot of sweet stuff in there that we can agree on. Uh, we all agree that you know the la laity should give a lot of money to our churches. That well, we all agree on that, <laughs> and uh, I mean, we shouldn't have to pay taxes, stuff like. So there's lots of universal agreement that you can have, and then you can have an end to the war of the religions, and you can have a more civilized religion. You have uh, Quakers and Episcopalians, and uh, as opposed to people who keep rattlesnakes at home to to prove that they can survive divide serpent serpent bites they take their rattlesnakes to church <laughs> you can say well there's a contradiction between you know that and some other churches some contradictions you can't work out and when those are when you can't work out two contra what does marx say if you have two sides and, the, and they both are completely in the right from their point of view it's settled by force and that's that's why you have the revolution because Bourgeoisie is not going to give up peacefully. Okay, but that's another another thing. So we have taken over um, these, these three positions then, the positions of dialectical materialism and contradiction, and we have to use historical materialism and context, and we get down to the uh, fourth, the fourth, and last feature that we need to do. And that is to say that what is the raison d'etre of Marxism? It is to, in my opinion, be the leading philosophy of the workers' movement. 
in the class struggle to overthrow the economic system of capitalism. Therefore, if you are going to be an art critic and use a Marxist philosophy of art to evaluate any work of art or any cultural expression at all, or for that matter, political expression or cooking class, if, whatever you want to do, you should be asking yourself whether this work of art in any way has any link up with the class struggle, directly or indirectly, that whatever else it may seek to explain, it should provide some insight and some help to the struggle for humanity to free itself from capitalism, because we think that capitalism is the last of a series of economic systems that rely on the exploitation of other human beings for it to operate. And that socialism will be an economic system in which people are not being exploited by other people. And that the wealth and goodies that are created by humanity will be shared throughout humanity on the basis both of you get back what you made and also on a higher level, people that can't help themselves will be helped by society too. That's from each to each according to ability and then to, to each according to need later. So that's the basis of a Marxist philosophy of art. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, I had a few questions here written down that I wanted to ask you. Um, they are on the longer side, so <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let you that. Uh, I'll let you know that ahead of time. But um, the first thing I wanted to ask is um, is in reference to a quote that that Marx uh, that Marx has uh, in, in the Grandrice. So in the intro to the Grandrice. Um, for those watching, it's, uh, it's written in 1857. Um, Marx uh, famously examines the value of Greek art. Um, he starts by affirming the historically specific ideological determinations behind it. And, and he says uh, that Greek art presupposes Greek mythology. Um, the question he asks himself then is, why does this Greek art provide us with aesthetic pleasures that seem even as an unattainable ideal. Um, to answer this, he provides us with, um, with the, uh, oh, I can't even understand my handwriting, uh, with the, what? <laughs> oh, um, uh, to, to answer this, he, he provides us with an analogy of the unattainability of, uh, of our return to a childhood and formulates the Greek epoch as humanity's blissful and, 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 and beautiful uh, childhood. Um, and like our own childhoods, um, it is something that will never occur again. And thus he states um, that it, its charm is rather the result of the fact with which it is rather inseparably linked that the immature social conditions under which it arose and could only arise can never recur again. So the question um, that, that I wanna ask is that it seems that he's implying here that, um, that there's a value that art might have in itself, right? Because before, before that he's mentioning uh, that the Greek uh, child was a good child, that there's some mischievous children that we don't <laughs> look back at in, in the same way. Um, so there's this value that art might have in itself, um, but there also seems to be, and uh, and I don't mean this in the traditional way in which we use the term, but there seems to be a temporally accumulated surplus value, um, not in the traditional sense, of course, but uh, that relates to our romantiz romanticization of an epoch that will never be again. Do you see a concrete valuative role in the romanticization of art? Um, if so, is there any way to distinguish whether our enjoyment of say Beethoven or Shakespeare 
is primarily an act of romanticization or is there a genuine epoch transcending value there? Well, I, you, you remember the work you quoted, the Grunitz, is um, just notes that he was making for capital. So I don't take things from that work and say, oh, this is, you know, this is gospel. Yeah. <laughs> this is the apocrypha. <laughs> we have the gospel in, the, in capital. <laughs> Greek art. I, the only interest, <clears throat> of course, he's talking about mythology. Yes, we can't create Greek mythology. That mythology wasn't consciously thought out. Today, we consciously think out things and look for reasons and try to have consistency in our ideas. This Greek was a hodgepodge of ideas that people before they were literate had as tribal peoples before they even formed together into make primitive states. They, they brought these ideas of gods and powers and nature that they couldn't understand together. <clears throat> and they ended up with this, you know, Apollo was born one way or another way, and that Zeus was one god, and Jupiter is a, whether they're the same god, but they have diff they do different things. Depending on the geographical area you are, the local the local god takes on the characteristics of the sky god. So it's if, if you can't systematize it. A book of mythology will say there are three or four origin legends for this god or that god or where it came from. <clears throat> So why do we, so we can't create stuff like that anymore. <laughs> well, well, we, we can, they're out there people thinking that God sent us uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> so, but they, they're not, these people presumably are not going to be reading Greek philosophy or going to Greek art shows and stuff. Why we like Greek art though is a good question. Art, the, the question is why is art from a different era with a different, type of exploitation, meaningful to us living in the bourgeois era or proletarians. <clears throat> Why is art that slave owners made still interesting to us? It's because the, the Greeks specifically are the ants, the Greeks were incorporated into the Roman Empire and the Romans adopted Greek thinking and put it together with their utilitarian empire building. And we, all of our cultures in the European cultures are the descendants of that. So, so it's pretty obvious that the problems, for instance, in the civil, in Athens, they had, people had problems that, you know, what happens when you die and all this other stuff. You have these great tragedies, uh, the problems that human beings have, Caldwell points us out too, there are common human biological responses to the world in, in which you live. And the great art tries to deal with that and explain that. And that's gonna happen to you whether you are the rich man or the poor man or whether you're, the, whether you're Shakespeare or you're Aeschylus. What's interesting is why this art, take music, I mean Beethoven, why this art appeals to the Japanese or the Chinese more than their art appeals back to us. They seem to be more open to taking themes, blood, Throne of Blood, <laughs> a Japanese movie, Macbeth. Oh, yeah. Then there's a S South African Zulu version, I think. There's one of the uh, King Lear, that's the Samurais. It's by the famous director, the, the one that does uh, the Samurai movies. Uh, Kurokawa, I think his name is. Yeah, it might be. Yes, we borrowed one of his. We made a movie called The Magnificent Seven, which is, <laughs> which is our Western version of the Seven Samurai, which he yeah, made. Yeah. And uh, later on today, I'm scheduled to watch on my Netflix thing, uh, Rashomon, which is one of his famous things. It's a good dialectical movie. If you haven't seen Rashomon, you've seen Rashomon? You've seen Rashomon. I have not, no. You've got to see Rashomon. It's somebody, it's a murder takes place of a woman in the woods and there are five witnesses. 
and the magistrate comes and he gets five entirely different stories of what they saw. <laughs> and he has to decide what really happened to this woman. <clears throat> so it's a good, it's a good uh, Hegelian movie. <clears throat> Hegel, just as an aside, Hegel, uh, the Indian philosophy people love Hegel. He, he caught on big in India. Mm -hmm. And there was some feedback because Schopenhauer based his philosophy on the Upanishads or part of it on the Upanishads. So I think it's the common human element in the thread from ancient Greece to our culture today. We say we like ancient Egypt. We have fads about ancient Egypt and go to see the pyramids and stuff, but there's very little of Egyptian values that you can find some of the values that, that we have in Egyptian literature, but because so much of it hasn't survived, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's why we concentrate on the Greeks. If they got it from Egypt, good, good for Egypt, but it's, it's the Greeks that are gonna get the credit for it <clears throat> because we, they're, they're gonna read Aristotle and Plato. Mm -hmm. But you, you can read in some of the literature, there's a sense of justice, a sense, sense that you shouldn't exploit people. Is there in ancient Egypt? There are, there are stories where the peasants always win, the peasant, the, the eloquent peasant, he argues his case to the Pharaoh when he's being abused by a bad, a bad Lord and he, he wins. So that's a, that's a message for everybody, you know, don't abuse your authority and be fair to the peasants. That's a, not a bad message to have. Yeah, okay, that's, so. we've been uh, also, we've been talking about art and, and what's seen more traditionally as, as art. Um, but I want to see if we can think about maybe expanding uh, the bounds of art. And again, another unpublished <laughs> uh, work from Marx is, is, uh, is where I'm going to ask where the question centers around. Um, so in, in the manuscripts, uh, Marx says that man forms things in accordance with beauty. Um, so it seems to be that in productive activity, uh, even just for the basic uh, um, production of subsistence, there seems to be an aesthetic artistic value to it. Um, so would, would we consider art to be limited to what's traditionally considered art um, or could work be considered art? Work, work does uh, destined just for one's means of subsistence. And uh, we also should make a distinction between work that's you know, de-alienated life activity and work under, you know, exploitative conditions. Um, is the work that's de-alienated life activity, would that be considered artistic? Um, or is all work that produces uh, uh, something, an expression of, uh, of, of beauty and art? Well, I think that answer, the question sort of answers itself. The manuscripts are another problem because he wrote the manuscripts before he, arrived at dialectical materialism as a philosophy. So there's- and historical materialism. Dialectical and historical materialism. We, we, the term di diamat is di yeah. all inclusive. Mm -hmm. when, you, when people talk about historical materialism and they emphasize historical materialism, it's because they there don't want the dialectic, don't believe the dialectic applies to nature. So they don't say, dialectical materialism because that includes nature and history. So they specialize on historical materialism. That's how you can have Catholic priests be calling themselves Marxists because they believe history works the way Marx said, but Jesus is behind it. <laughs> so that's not one of the themes that Marx uh, stressed. So of course, uh, if you look at cabinet making, people who make cabinets, they just don't throw them together. They want to make them as beautiful as they can. You look at, well, why do we still collect Louis the 16th furniture or something? Ming vases. So uh, these vases were made for utilitarian purposes, but they were made to be beautiful. The, the Greek vases that we go, I think the <laughs> Metropolitan Museum paid over a million dollars for the Euphronius vase. You went down and so it was a beautiful vase. It was a utilitarian. They had to give it back to Greece 
because <laughs> they bought it from a guy who didn't have his papers in order. So they were out to a million dollars. And the, the, if you lived in New York, it, there were lines to see the Euphronius. This was back in the 70s. Hey, we, we got to see this. <laughs> and uh, I think 20 years later, it was packed up and shipped back to Athens. So it's, it's now gone. So yes, the people who, uh, the, uh, the African art that we have in our museums was not made by artists. Uh, our art is made now today, bourgeois art is made for the art market. And the films are made to make money. The, uh, as the aesthetic, the, we have, what do they talk uh, about those little, the little art house movies they make, okay, that's fine. But the big blockbusters, they will sacrifice aesthetic values and values of beauty uh, for anything that will bring a crowd in to make money. So there's all, so your question is all full of all sorts of problems uh, for the answer. But I think anybody who sits down, uh, who, if you're a house painter, you wanna paint that house. So you don't wanna have brush strokes going the wrong way and miss the patch. You want to paint that house so it looks is nice for the customer. And so it's also for money, but you also take pride. When you take pride in your work because it expresses something that you want to do and it's valued by others, I don't know why a person wouldn't consider that an aesthetic experience and the realm of art philosophy is subsumed under aesthetic theory. Mm -hmm. Nice, and, and in connection to that, one of the last points that you made about Caldwell is um, the connection between science and art um, and them being basically two aspects of the same coin um, and two different aspects of, of two different ways in which we can um, understand the world. So what, what form of understanding do we get from, from the artistic experience? Well, the artistic experience is, <laughs> that has, it has to be, an individual reaction. I mean, I don't know what you get out of it. And you, well, you may not get the same thing I get out of it. Um, if it is, if the artist is writing or, or creating a work of art, it should be relevant somehow to your living standard. I mean, you just because you want somebody to hang on the wall, you can go buy that type of art at the, at the I don't know, do they still have Woolworths around? I don't, I don't, anything I get, I can get from Amazon now. And, <laughs> and Amazon exploits its workers and doesn't uh, have unions and stuff, but what do you say? Like they, all these other stores, you keep, they're closed. So, mm -hmm. so to me, it, uh, what you're supposed to get is what the artist is trying to express about the nature of the reality he lives in, and he recreates that in, his, in a play or novel or a poem or a statue or whatever he does. And he succeeds if there's resonance in people who see it or hear it or, or read it. If nobody gets anything out of it, then it's a boop, that's a guy you never hear of again, or a woman, you never hear of them again. And the things that stay around are things that still have some power over us and, a, and not a power to do bad things to people, but just it makes you feel better about the world and, and, other, and other people. Renaissance art, we're not Catholics anymore except in name, uh, but those great paintings, the, what is it, The Last Supper, that's a, that's a, people see that and they, they recognize the technical ability of, of Da Vinci, but they are in the color and the, you get an impression and you just feel good looking at that. Uh, even though you don't believe that there was a last supper the way that's portrayed that way. <clears throat> and you're not particularly Catholic. And these pictures were commissioned with religious intent for utilitarian purposes. Yes, to decorate the wall of the monastery, but also to reinforce the ruling ideas that the church is powerful and then you should obey the church and the church is legitimate and Jesus is with the church. And 
people who are uneducated see these paintings and go in these churches and they get this reinforcement, it is it reinforces the ruling class. But it doesn't, but now we know that. And we can subtract that from it and say, look, what what does it have left? And it has left the ab ability through proportion and the mixture of color and the showing of these things that we know from our own cultural and historical past that it just is something that emotionally appeals to us. It's not something, philosophy is to think about it, <laughs> but to feel about it is aesthetics. And then you can ask philosophy to talk about this feeling, but philosophy can't recreate that feeling. People either see it or they don't. They either listen to rap music or Beethoven or both, depending on how expansive they are in their tastes. Yeah, you, one of the things you mentioned there is trying to sort of bracket out the, the class implications that might be in art. Um, one of the things that I look for Sanchez Vasquez who went in, in the Hispanic American uh, community of Marxists, he's, he's sort of at the head of, of Marxist aesthetics. Um, one of the things he mentions is that you're able to experience the universality of, of art once the roots of the uh, once its class roots sort of fade away and 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 no longer produce fruit i think the, the phrase goes something like that um so it is there a role is, is this experience that we have of enjoying art that um that belongs to a completely different epoch um is this an experience of, of universality or and and shall we distinguish if so between something like a human universal that manifests itself through a particular and a more idealist universal that exists you know before any an interaction um with with any particulars you know i can only give an example of an ancient work of art that comes from a culture that is ancestral to our culture but doesn't exist anymore and that is ancient greece is hegel thought the most greatest play ever written was uh, I'm getting a blank now <laughs> um, not Medea but uh, I can't just I'm just having a blank on that name and I just had it it's the one uh, where the girl buries her brother and uh, Antigone it, he thought Antigone was the greatest play because here was um, the king has ordered the invading army when they're killed off that their bodies should be left exposed to the vultures. <laughs> Whereas in Greek, you have to bury them. Somehow you have to bury them or, or, or their souls will wander around and they won't be happy. <laughs> so, she, and it's a, incumbent on her as the sister of one of the warriors. <laughs> one of the leaders that was killed out there is her, her brother. <clears throat> and she defies the king's order and she goes and scatters dust over the body. Uh, it's like sprinkling as opposed to immersion. You, you did it. <clears throat> and so she is then condemned to death <clears throat> and walled up somewhere. <clears throat> and the struggle there is not only, now of course I can't appreciate that because I my Greek is very limited and it, it's not uh, going to be reading Sophocles. Uh, uh, just some philosophical terms that you have to learn <laughs> to get through Aristotle and Plato. Uh, the, um, the conflict there though is the private right of religion and ethics for the individual and the, and the right of the state. The state definitely has the right to defend itself kill an enemy army attacking it and is under no obligation to respect anything about that army, just drag the bodies and throw them in a trench somewhere, but not bury them. Uh, and what? And so what is the duty of the citizen? Is it to do obey the laws of the state? Certainly that's your duty. Um, or is it to 
carry out this religious obligation you're under as a sister to her brother's spirit, which is also something you have to do. So she is caught, Antigone is caught between two duties mm. and she does the family duty. And so she is, I think Creon is the name of the king. He publishes, she is then, and he, by the way, likes her. He, he loves Antigone, <clears throat> uh, but uh, he thinks that it's necessary for him to defend the, the power of the state. And if he shows an act of mercy, he threatens the legal system. People, oh, we can get away with this now. <clears throat> and so he must carry out the execution even though he doesn't want to. So that's a real, a real problem and that play, I mean, Sophocles was, uh, was a uh, pretty good writer. And so that play is still being performed today in Greek <laughs> and also in English over here. So that's one of the reasons, and uh, that, yeah, that's one of the reasons that these artworks that pop up in completely alien cultures to ours we don't live in city states based on slavery and um, New Brooklyn and New York don't go to war all the time. Just, just citizens go to war at the free store in here a lot, but it's, it's not the same as the wars in Athens against Sparta. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, well, I had uh, one more um, question that's sort of more contextual and, and perhaps even more aiming at, at the future. Um, one of the things that we have, talked about is art as a meaningful experience, not just in its creation, but in the experience of art. Um, where would that put the role of like uh, artificial intelligence creations of art or just machinery created art? Like when I, when I go to Ross and buy a frame, I, I have an aesthetic experience of the frame. I might enjoy it, but that was something that was made in some machine that, you know, all that the person uh, that was engaging with it did was really just press a button and it printed out a nice canvas with a nice picture, um, which would imply some form of, there's obviously like dead labor behind it, but um, it seems to be more disconnected than an actual productive activity that went into, into an art piece. Um, with that ex experience of art, um, with that aesthetic experience, be any less real if it was made from, from a machine. Well, if you have the experience, there can't be, if you're having aesthetic experience, you're having aesthetic experience, it can't be less real mm -hmm. uh, or more real. It's a, like people, it's the same argument that you're using here that people use in, in ethics, where a person says that they get pleasure from X. And so the good is, is pleasure. And somebody says, no, that's not real pleasure. Real pleasure is reading a book by Aristotle. So you don't know what real pleasure is because you've never had it. But if you have pleasure, you have pleasure. And that's it. That's why they're different. That's why there are different tastes. That's why there's Shakespeare and comic books. You know, because people have get pleasure in different ways. In our society, in, in the ancient world, there was no training and education to have aesthetic experiences. You either, the work of art was an integral part of your culture. You grew up with it. People grew up, like in the 19th century, everybody had, not everybody, but there were, everybody had pianos in their house. Everybody, kids always, everybody could play pianos. <clears throat> And today, no, <laughs> very few people can actually sit down and play pianos. Uh, but Beethoven wrote all these little songs and stuff. It was sold off thousands of copies. All everybody in town would be playing is like they like we whistle. <clears throat> you could people could play pianos. And our culture is so complicated compared to the uh, way ancient Greece. It was complicated, but it doesn't have all the different layers and subclasses and specialists that we have, medicine didn't have, like now one doctor can't talk to another. Heart guy doesn't know what's going on with your stomach. And uh, in their ancient doctor did everything, which was 
nothing. It was like, oh, the best doctor is the one that doesn't work on you. And just leave your leech and go, go away. So in our culture, we have to educate ourselves. And people have, it's like little kids don't like coffee, but they learn to, from watching their parents and they end up liking coffee. And then they got enough dependent on, you gotta have coffee to wake up in the morning. Same thing with art. If you um, haven't been exposed to Shakespeare, if you haven't been exposed to Greek art, uh, you're not going to have any aesthetic relationship with it. You may just have aesthetic relationship with the things. And if you live out in the countryside with trees and stuff, you might beauty, beauty in nature. You, you'll, you have us. We are capable of aesthetic experiences. Um, that's one of the big questions that Hegel wants to ask, whether, whether beauty is, you can have, is whether nature can be beautiful or real beauty, real aesthetics has to be, have the human stamp on it. That real art is something made by humans and expresses the human essence. And if it's just a natural object that, that has got nothing human about it, uh, it can't, he wouldn't put that into art. So he, he wouldn't go collecting driftwood along the beach, <laughs> taking it home and putting it on the table. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> a little dead crab in there, get it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. nice. I, I think we've touched uh, quite a few topics. It was really insightful um, discussion. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, for being here. I hope that those of you that are watching it on, on YouTube uh, enjoyed the, the chat. Um, was there anything you would like to say before we stop recording, Dr. Riggins? Uh, no, <laughs> just <laughs> put my head gets in there and not the, you know, the, the <laughs> well, it's been in there most of the time, so. Okay. Okay, all right, see you all. Okay.